Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you are safe and doing well during this unprecedented time. My name is Stephanie Creedon, and I'll be your host for today's webinar on what you need to know, PPP, loan forgiveness, accounting, and tax considerations. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. Today's presentation will be one hour and the slides can be downloaded at www.wolfandco.com forward slash webinars forward slash 2020. Our audience will be muted during the session. If you have any questions at any point throughout the presentation, please send them in to me by using the Q&A feature located on the webinars control panel. If time allows, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ryan Gorman, an audit principal here at Wolf & Company. Thanks so much for presenting today, and I'll now hand the presentation over to Ryan to get started. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you everyone for, for joining today's webinar. Uh, this topic continues to, to draw a crowd and we are going to do what we can uh, to provide you with our insights based on our continuing monitoring of this guidance uh, that's being issued. Um, I know some of you also sat in on last week's webinar on a similar topic and we've attempted to update this presentation with any new information that's been, been coming out. Um, some of it may sound a little bit repetitive, but we've tried to implement all the, the new uh, guidance that has been issued. Uh, so we've received a significant amount of questions in advance of this webinar. We've gone through them. We tried our best to customize this presentation to be able to address those items. Time permitting, as Stephanie indicated, we'll address any other questions you have at the end of this presentation. Uh, however, please realize that many of your questions are very specific to your business, and many of them have not yet been addressed by the guidance. There are a lot of unanswered questions right now, and the SBA and the Treasury Department have not yet issued their rules surrounding loan forgiveness. Uh, we had expected to have those in hand by now. Instead, what we have is um, these, these frequently asked questions, which I'll refer to as FAQs, issued by these departments uh, that are intended to be authoritative. I would urge everyone to monitor those FAQs as it seems to be one or two new items uh, are being added every few days. As of this morning, there are 44 FAQs, uh, though I will say they are not all specific to the loan forgiveness, but rather cover all aspects of the PPP. Uh, loan pro program. We're going to continue to monitor and provide updates as they uh, come in. Uh, we'll keep those on our COVID-19 Resource Center, which you can find on our webpage. So I'd urge everyone to uh, check that webpage regularly. So before we begin, uh, just a little bit about Wolf & Company. Wolf is a 108-year-old firm that employs over 250 professionals. Uh, during those 108 years, we've certainly seen our share of economic ups and downs. Uh, we have the experience, the expertise to serve our clients with confidence and stability in this rapidly changing world. Our professionals provide audit, tax, and risk management services to various industries with a focus on serving financial institutions, the healthcare industry, investment managers and advisors, manufacturers, distributors and retailers, and technology-based businesses. Uh, we have offices located in the Northeast, uh, but we do service clients well beyond that area, including those with a global reach. My name is Ryan Gorman. I'm a principal with the firm and I lead the firm's manufacturing, distribution and retail services team. I'm joined today by Dan Morrow. Dan is a principal with the firm and he leads our professional practice team. Uh, that means he's responsible for the overall quality of our firm's services in disseminating new rules and regulations um, as they come in, including the CARES Act and the related rules. Mike Straven is a principal in our corporate tax group, uh, works with essentially all of the industries I previously listed, and Ryan Brunel is a principal in our tax group with a strong focus on individual and trust taxation. So we're gonna begin our discussion today around the accounting for the PPP loan, uh, and then we'll switch gears to discuss the loan forgiveness this is where the majority of you have questions and, and we're certainly gonna spend the bulk of the time here discussing the loan forgiveness. Uh, finally, we'll, we'll discuss any tax matters specific to the loan forgiveness as well. <clears throat> so let's begin with the accounting for the loan. Once those proceeds come in the door, we, we recommend that all borrowers record the debt on their books as a liability. Uh, how and when that liability unwinds is still a matter of debate and the FASB has not yet issued any guidance here. Dan, anything you want to add here? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the one the one thing that's that's certain is that when the you know you get the proceeds in, it certainly is a liability recorded as a liability. You begin to accrue the interest at the one percent. You know, the pattern of recognition when there is forgiveness that's that's the question that is uh, you know that being being debated right now. And there's really two different patterns. One is as the expenses um, are being incurred, and the other is. Um, you know, when it's really the debt is forgiven. And we'll talk about, there's four alternatives being discussed. Uh, you know, and the other second issue is, is the forgiveness income or is it recorded as a reduction of the expense? And what I'm gonna talk about here is from the accounting side, not the tax side. Uh, there are certainly some tax consequences. There's been guidance uh, that was recently issued and that's uh, what Mike and Ryan will be talking about a little later. So what I'm talking about here is, is strictly on the accounting side, not the tax side. So the four alternatives that are being discussed uh, is one is that it's considered to be debt forgiveness and you'd recognize it as debt forgiveness income when the amounts are legally forgiven uh, by the SBA. The second uh, way of accounting would be analogous to something that's in the international accounting standards for grant accounting. And you would record, you would basically record forgiveness as the expenses are incurred over the eight week period. And you would either record that forgiveness as either income or reduction of expenses um, via policy decision. The third method would be as a gain contingency and you record that it as income when forgiveness occurs or the settlement of the event giving rise to the contingency occurred. And to me, that would probably be at the time that uh, forgiveness is reasonably assured. And the last uh, way of accounting would be akin to accounting for contributions on a not-for-profit. Um, so sort of analogous to that guidance as and recognize, recognize the forgiveness uh, when the conditions for forgiveness are met. So those are really the four different methods of accounting, you know, for the forgiveness aspect of the loan. And, and as Ryan mentioned, we're still um, waiting for, for guidance that says which of these ways may be an acceptable method. Those are the four that are out there. And as I mentioned, Mike and, and Ryan will be talking a little bit about the taxes or a lot about the taxes. I think there was some, some guidance that came out that's pretty important. So they'll be touching on that aspect a little bit later. Thanks, Dan. And, and certainly as, uh, as new guidance is issued again, this will be posted on our, uh, our COVID resource page off our, off our website. So in terms of the cash, um, while it's not required, uh, as a best practice, we would recommend you establish a separate bank account and or a general ledger account to help track the use of these proceeds. Um, either pay the qualifying expenses out of that account or make general ledger cash transfers that allow you to point to that specific payment. Um, detailed tracking of these payments is it's going to be critical to help support that loan forgiveness application. Um, yeah, I think Ryan, I think that's, that's so critical. It's such a great message that the tracking of this is going to be incredibly important because as the guidance continues to evolve and comes out, um, you really need good records for this, you know, to qualify for the forgiveness, um, to be able to provide to your lender. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the, um, some of the FAQs that came out recently um, that talk about the, the forgiveness application process and qualifying. Uh, certainly an area that's gotten a lot of attention recently. So, you know, let's, let's now move away from the accounting, talk about, you know, the loan forgiveness itself. So this, this has been an area that has left borrowers, uh, lenders, as well as advisors um, with, with more questions than, than answers. Um, there's certainly no shortage of information online in regards to the PPP loan program. Uh, however, you know, much of that information is scattered. Uh, it, it's, it's interpretive and, and it's not authoritative. Um, I would just caution everyone to be mindful of the source of the information you're reading and remind you that other than the loan program and the FAQs, there's been little uh, that's been issued by the SBA or the Treasury Department regarding the loan forgiveness. Um, so with that said, let's talk about what we do know. Uh, so the way the program's currently written, lenders have 10 calendar days to fund the loan post-approval. Uh, once that's funded, borrowers have an eight week period from that funding date to use the funds. Um, 
Dan, anything anything to add there? Is that? Yeah, I think one of the one of the questions that that we've received quite a bit, and, it, and it's a, it's a absolutely a valid question and issue right now is, you know, some businesses are shut down; they're non-essential. Um, so the guidance is pretty clear that it's the eight week period starts when the funds are dispersed, when you receive those funds. You can't postpone it, um, you know, you can't delay it. And one of the things that some of the guidance, recent guidance that they came out was they said basically the loan is canceled if, you, if within 20 days of uh, the approval essentially you haven't the borrower hasn't provided all of the relevant documentation uh you know to finalize the loan and get it dispersed you know so the issue is you know what if i'm not back in business during during the eight week period you know that's definitely an issue and, and i think we're, we're, we're obviously awaiting guidance um on that if they're gonna you know if they'll come out with any guidance on that so it's, it's a pretty big issue um at this point because you know certainly the quarantine and and you know keeping the economy closed has gone on probably longer than was anticipated at the start. Just one other thing to add is you can't partially fund the loan. So if the loan is for 50,000, uh, you cannot just take 25,000 today and save the other 25 for later. It needs to be funded all, uh, all at once. Thanks. And so that day that that's funded, that's when that eight weeks starts as it currently stands. Now, in order to qualify for loan forgiveness, um, I'm sure this is nothing new to any of you, at least 75% of the proceeds uh, must be used for payroll and related costs, and then no more than 25% uh, may, may be used for the other qualifying costs. So those are the mortgage interest, the rents, and the utilities. Um, so Dan, we, we received some questions around this 75-25 uh, criteria. You know, any, any insight as to what happens if a business uh, cannot meet that 75% threshold. You know, for example, uh, let's assume only 70% is payroll and, and the remaining 30% is non-payroll cost. Can any of the loan be forgiven? Yeah, and it's actually a relevant question because we, we've received a bunch of questions on this and we already received one today. Um, it, it's not sort of a cliff vesting, right? So if you don't meet the 75%, it means none of it's forgivable. No, that's not the case. Um, what I will say is there's there's a couple different schools of thought around how that will work. Meaning if I have, you know, let's say I have 30%, you know, in your example, 70% is payroll and 30% is other. The rules are very clear that the other piece is limited to 25%. So one school of thought would say that you have 70% for payroll, 25% uh, is capped at 25% for the other. Therefore your maximum loan forgiveness amount prior to doing any of the other haircut calculations we'll talk about would be 95% of the original loan. Um, you know, recently I was on a webinar that had some representatives from, uh, from the SBA on there. And, you know, one of the thoughts that I took away from that webinar was that there could be a proportionate method utilized, meaning if I you know, if let's say my payroll, I use 60% of the 75% of payroll, well, that's an 80% ratio, right? I use 60 out of 75 or 80%. Therefore, my forgiveness for the other 25% is capped at 80% of that 25% or now 20%. Um, we don't have an answer on that uh, just yet. Um, you know, so there are a couple schools, different schools of thought there uh, on that. But the one thing that, that I think is certain is that the limitation, you know, no more than 25% of other qualified expenses um, will be forgiven, whether it's a lesser amount based on that proportionate um, calculation I just talked about remains to be seen, but I would expect, hopefully we'll see some guidance on that. Thanks, Dan. It's uh, certainly interesting to hear the different perspectives, even, even from the mouths of uh, representatives at the SBA. Um, you know, many, many of the questions uh, we've received also relate to the definition of, of payroll and related costs. So our understanding is that eligible payroll includes salaries and wages, commissions, tips, uh, housing stipends or allowances, um, retirement benefit payments, such as employer, employer or 401k payments, for example, um, group health care benefits, uh, as well as payments for vacation, medical and sick leave. 
Now, as important to note, um, eligibility does not include payments to independent contractors, um, nor does it include payments for qualified sick or parental leave uh, under the Families First Coronavirus uh, Response Act. And finally, it does not include compensation over that $100,000 threshold. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that the $100,000 threshold applies to the cash compensation, your salaries, wages, and not to the non-cash benefits. Uh, such as retirement benefit payments and, and, and the health care benefits. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to payroll and related costs, you know, Ryan, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to talk a little bit about the independent contractor and, and the Schedule C's and um, sell, sole proprietors and things like that. I know we've gotten a lot of questions as to whether, you know, a 1099 employee can qualifies uh, as payroll for forgiveness. Um, you know, and the answer, I think the guidance is out there and it's fairly clear that because they can apply on their own uh, for their own loan that they can't be um, considered as, as part of payroll cost. Yeah, that's right, Dan. So for a self-employed individual, just to add to that, there's an inclusion of owner compensation replacement in determining total payroll costs. So the owner compensation replacement is equal to the net the 2019 Schedule C that was used to apply for PPP loan funding with a maximum net profit of $100,000. Loan forgiveness attributable to the owner compensation replacement will be subject to the same eight week limitation with a maximum forgiveness of amount of $15,385. And then just to talk about uh, the self-employed individual a little bit more, the same other expenses apply here. So your business mortgage interest, rent payments, and utility payments will be factored into the loan forgiveness calculation to the extent the obligations or agreements were in place as of February 15, 2020, and to the extent these expenses were deducted or eligible to be deducted on the 2019 Schedule C. The logic behind the limitation is that the PPP funds are intended to maintain existing operations and payroll and are not intended for business expansion. And lastly, I know we've, we've received a number of questions as to what counts as a utility for purposes of the loan forgiveness calculation. The act defines a covered utility as a payment for a service for the distribution of electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, or internet access for which service began prior to February 15, 2020. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, and we, we've gotten so many questions about what qualifies, you know, as, as expenses for rent and utilities, and we continue to get questions. And, um, you know, Ryan, do you have any, any thoughts on, on the utilities aspect? Yeah, just, you know, to the extent uh, those deductions were included in your home office calculation, um, they'll be deductible or includable in the loan forgiveness calculation. Uh, to the extent they were included on the Schedule C under 2019 Schedule C. Thanks, Ryan. And one question that, that we get a lot is, you know, they have the concept of $100,000 of, of um, you know, payroll and related costs. And I think, you know, everything that we're hearing out there is that if you do the math, if you take 100,000 divided by 52, multiply by eight weeks, it, it sort of caps that amount at fifteen thousand three hundred eighty-five for you know for what could be forgiven during that eight-week period. You know, so we've gotten a lot of questions about you know can I accelerate bonuses and pay them during this time period? Um, can I prepay payroll? You know, we don't have necessarily answers to those questions right now. You know, we'd be looking for some guidance, but I think the the one thing we do know is that you know for any individual employee that number is probably going to be capped at fifteen thousand. Um, 385, which is that, you know, the calculation I just did, um, you know, based on the $100,000 $100, limit. Thanks, Dan. Dan, there's, there's also been um, a number of questions around the, the, the timing of spend. You know, this is the whole cash versus accrual uh, issue, and I know we've talked about this a lot. Uh, you know, as an example, right, can, I, can a borrower prepay costs, or are you limited to the expenses that you've incurred during the period, right? So um, prepaid rent seems to, to to be an example that we've gotten some questions on a lot. Um, anything in the guidance that helps to clarify, you know, what we're looking at from the cash versus accrual basis? 
Um, yeah, I mean, the guidance talks about costs being incurred and costs being paid. You know, they define covered um, rent costs as an obligation to pay the rent. So that right now, I don't think we have a concrete answer. I think that's something that we're looking for the SBA to provide some guidance on is, is you know, what expenses can be really incurred during that period. The one thing that I think is important is, is really important and we're going to talk a little bit about the integrity or the certification that needed to be made. You know, one thing that um, I think is just is really important is, is, you know, Ryan, you know, you and I have talked about this is, you know, we heard yesterday on, on the webinar, this, the term that was used was, you know, ordinary and customary, right? So if you're trying to jam payroll costs that aren't ordinary and customary into this eight week period, they may get questioned. Um, you know, so that's one thing I would just caution, you know, or trying to prepay rent. If it's not ordinary and customary for you to do that, you know, maybe that's something that, that would not be forgiven if your, if your file was to be reviewed. Um, so that's just, you know, some cautionary bit of advice. You know, if we heard this term, I, I sort of like the ordinary and customary. Yeah, I, I would agree there. Um, you know, we, we also received questions uh, regarding, you know, related party rents and whether those qualify. I mean, right now, we haven't seen anything to the, to the contrary there. And again, I'd, I'd go back to the ordinary and, and customary practices in terms of the rent um, being charged, etc. Uh, we also had some questions on, on lease arrangements, areas such as uh, common area maintenance, allocation of any, you know, property taxes or, or property insurance and whether those qualify. Um, Dan, anything further here on the, the leases to, to hit upon? I think, well, just some thoughts on, you know, on, on mortgage interest and let's say you had a line of credit and you had drawn the line of credit. And the one thing, you know, these all have to be agreements that were in place as of February 15th, 2020. So if you entered into a new lease afterwards, those, you know, that rent expense wouldn't qualify. Uh, they all, they had to be agreements that were in place as of February 15th. But some questions have come up. What if I had a line of credit in place that I hadn't drawn on? And then because of, you know, the, uh, the impacts that my business being felt, I had to draw on the line. Does the interest I paid in the eight weeks on that drawn on line qualify, even though I didn't hadn't drawn on it before February 15th? So there's a lot of questions surrounding um, surrounding this, you know, around the forgivable other expenses. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions today, so hopefully we are able to, um, you know, to answer some of those questions. I know we got you know a question, in, a bunch of questions surrounding. You know what does transportation mean, <laughs> and I don't. I don't think we really know the answer to that, do we, Ryan? I have not seen anything that clarifies that at this point in time. Right. Great. You know, one thing I just wanted to to bring up. Um, you know, absent of a better place to to bring it up is, is just I know we have we have a lot of lenders on on this call, and they came out with some guidance last week that. Uh, probably last Monday or Tuesday, I think, that talked about the PPP processing fee, um, you know, that the banks will get uh, for uh, originating these loans. And just that, you know, the lenders have to file, just to make you aware, file form 1502 uh, with the SBA in order to be, to get that processing fee. And they must file that within 20 calendar days of approval by the SBA of the loan. And one interesting thing to note is that if a borrower took the funds, you funded them, and then they return the funds under the safe harbor provisions uh, that we'll talk about the question, sort of question 31 on the treasury guidance, uh, you will not get a PPP processing fee for, for that loan. Uh, they're very clear about that. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the loan may be forgiven in whole or in part. Um, aside from that 75-25 split criteria, the amount of loan forgiveness will also be reduced by uh, one of two items. So the first being any reduction in the ratio of the average number of monthly uh, full-time equivalent employees, that's FTEEs, uh, during the covered period uh, versus those employed during either of two uh, reference periods. Those reference periods being um, the four and a half months from February 15th to June 30th of 2019, uh, or the two-month period, January 1 to February 29th, 2020. 
we had no shortage of questions um, around these these calculations as well. Uh, Dan, anything here you want to add? Yeah, I think one of the key points uh, is you know the terminology of full time equivalent employees, right? It's not FTEs, it's FTEEs, uh, which I think it, it is interesting, and they don't really define that. Um, and other parts of the CARES Act, they do refer you uh, to the Internal Revenue Code's definition. Um, very narrow scope issue that they refer you to, but that could be some guidance to look towards, uh, absent anything else that's, that comes out if they don't put out any guidance on this. And essentially what that guidance says is that a full-time uh, employee is anyone that works 30 plus hours. And then the full-time equivalent employee basically takes anyone that doesn't work 30 hours, adds up all the hours that they worked and divide that by 120. And that would give you the number of, of full-time equivalent employees. Um, you know, so I think that's interesting. They may put out some guidance, but you know, they really didn't define, define that piece. Okay. Now, the second piece, uh, total loan fig figure miss may also be uh, further reduced by the amount of any reduction in total salary or wages of any employee during the covered period in excess of 25% of the total wages and salary of the employee during the most recent full quarter during which that employee was employed. Um, and this takes into account only employees whose annualized salary uh, was less than $100,000. Yeah, so there's some interesting interesting things in this haircut calculation. And one thing I just wanna mention on, on the first piece on the reduction of full-time equivalent employees is, you know, Ryan had mentioned that there's two periods to look back towards you know, so just keep that in mind when you're looking at that calculation. One might be more beneficial uh, to you than the other, depending on if you had to uh, begin to furlough or lay off people prior, you know, within that January 1st, 2020 to February uh, 29th timeframe. But as you can see on the slide here, it, you know, one of the things that is interesting to me is that the comparison of all employees with less than 100,000 in wages in 2019, right? So if you hired employees in 2020, uh, they don't factor into this calculation as the rules written. Um, and it's with the most recent full quarter that an employee was employed. You know, the question that I have is, what is that most recent full quarter? Does it, is it coincide with the calendar quarters? Does it coincide with your Fiscal, you know, let's say that you were a January 31st fiscal year end. Are your quarters now April 30th and, and on? Um, you know, so those are some of the questions that I'd be looking, you know, for a little bit more guidance on uh, in this regard. And we've gotten some, you know, we've gotten questions, a lot of questions surrounding surrounding this uh, the full time equivalent employees and. And what if somebody doesn't come back and I hire somebody else, you know, do they count? And the answer to that is yes. It's not based on a, an individual. It's, ba it's, you know, it's not based on a specific person. It's based on the count of full-time equivalent employees. You know, we got a number of questions on the wages. One in particular asking if I reduce my wages by 10% um, during this, you know, will I meet that 25% threshold? And I think the answer to that is yes. You know, if you decreased and they still work the same number of hours, their decrease was probably only 10%, not the, not the 25%. Uh, and again, it only applies to employees that uh, were worked in 2019. And I think the other thing that that's interesting when calculating this, it's comparison of all employees with less than 100,000 in wages in 2019. And as the rules written, uh, it's really, it, it appears to be written that to calculate that 100,000, you look at their highest pay period in 2019 and annualize that number. So if there are bonuses, you know, paid during the year, you might want to look to that because that may allow you to have more employees that don't qualify, um, you know, for this reduction in wage calculation. Because they would go over that 100,000 threshold on exactly. that. Exactly, 2019. Right. 
Great. Now, uh, finally, the, there's re the, these reductions in employment or salary that occur between um, Feb 15 and, and April 26th uh, can be cured, um, would, would not reduce the amount of forgiveness if by June 30th of 2020, um, the borrower eliminates the reduction in employees or the reduction in wages. Um, and as Dan mentioned, there's no requirement that the borrower rehire the same employees, restoring the number of um, full-time equivalent employees is sufficient. Um, now, another thing just to note here on May 3rd, uh, the Treasury Department stated that a borrower's loan forgiveness amount uh, will not be reduced if the borrower laid off an employee, offered to rehire the same employee with similar terms, but the employee declined the offer, provided that the offer and rejection are well documented. Um, you know, that, that this particular FAQ also indicated that any individual who, who rejects that offer uh, may have to forfeit their, their unemployment compensation. Uh, so certain in area, certainly an area the Treasury Department is uh, paying attention to. Yeah, and I think that'll be critical to have have the documentation in place, you know, that you made a bona fide offer and that it was that it was rejected um, for that. Okay. Um, now, you know, borrowers need to be prepared and able to support their forgiveness request. Um, you know, we suggest that all borrowers gather up payroll registers, health insurance invoices, lease agreements, mortgage statements and utility bills. Um, gather all the canceled checks, uh, and keep a spreadsheet that allows you to match the disbursement uh, with, the, with the related bill. Um, in addition, we would suggest you maintain a worksheet that tracks all your payroll costs and allows you to monitor that 75-25 split. Uh, that way, at the end of that eight-week period, th th there's no surprises when you go to uh, apply for the loan forgiveness. Um, now, you know, there's, there's been a lot of discussion and publicity recently in regards to this program, um, particularly surrounding that good faith certification made and, and the loan forgiveness application. Uh, and we've received a, a number of questions on these matters. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna summarize some of the FAQs to you. I'll turn it over to Dan as well after, but there's several FAQs uh, that the Treasury Department and SBA have issued that, that deal with these matters. So specifically um, number 31, which was published on April 23rd, um, it was specifically addressed large companies with adequate sources of liquidity and whether they qualify for a PPP loan. Um, it states that a business, and I'm quoting, a business must take into account their current business activity and their ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support their ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. Um, so I'm, I'm going to repeat that because it's a, it's a long sentence. Um, a business must take into account their current business activity and their ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support their ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. Um, so certainly an area where there's gonna be a lot of judgment and scrutiny and, and, and some gray area. It goes on to give an example of a public company with substantial market value and access to capital markets indicating that it's unlikely such a business could make the required good faith certification. Now, five days later, uh, FAQ 37 was issued, um, which was specific to privately held businesses uh, that have adequate sources of liquidity. Um, and all that, that question does is it references right back to FAQ number 31. Um, so in other words, you know, the same criteria applies for both private and publicly held businesses. Okay, now on April 29th, uh, FAQ number 39 was issued. Um, and that's the one that stated that the SBA in consulting with the Department of, of Treasury, uh, we'll review a selection of loans um, after the lender's submission of the borrower's forgiveness application. Uh, and that, you know, all loans greater than 2 million will be subject to review. So if you've got a PPP greater than 2 million, it will be subject to some level of scrutiny. And then other loans, uh, I don't know what the process for selecting those loans will be, will also be subject to it. Uh, additional guidance regarding this is, is expected shortly. And then one more. So finally yesterday, uh, last night, FAQ number 43 was issued. And what that did was extended the safe harbor period uh, for any businesses that elect to return the proceeds. And that moves it from uh, May 7th uh, out to May 14th. And some additional guidance regarding that process is supposed to be coming in advance of that date. Dan, anything you want to add there? I don't yeah, want to. That, that was a lot of information right there. Um, yeah, and the, these, these questions that have that have come out, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions surrounding this. Um, you know, we've got a, a few questions already today that we'll go over in the Q and A uh, as to as to what what this all means. And I, I think, 
you know, at the very beginning, the, the SBA has a requirement that was waived for the PPP program. Um, basically that you need to go out and find it, whether or not you can get credit elsewhere. And if the answer is no, then you come to the SBA. They waive that requirement, the requirement to, um, that you're unable to obtain credit elsewhere shall not apply to the PPP program, right? And that was very clear from the beginning. You know, so the question becomes is, well, what, it, what does it mean to have the ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support ongoing operations? You know, for example, what if I, what if I have a line of credit I haven't drawn upon? And yeah, I could draw upon the line of credit and that might get me through the eight week period, but then I don't, I don't have, you know, enough, I don't have liquidity at that point. And at that point I can't apply for a PPP loan, right? So this, these are real situations that, that businesses have faced, you know, so is it better off to apply and get the PPP loan, use it for the eight week period uh, on the qualified expenses. And then if you need to draw on your line after you have that liquidity, you know, would that be considered detrimental, significantly detrimental to the business? You know, so to me, those are some of the key, you know, the key things that, you know, do you have access to other sources of liquidity along with the fact that it will not be significantly detrimental to the business? And I think if you're, if you're concerned about this, you, you probably should have some good documentation and maybe consult with, um, you know, with your legal counsel, uh, and making sure you have documentation on this. And, and you know, one of the questions that I thought was, was fairly interesting that we have in, and I think I'll, I'll address, it, um, address it here, you know, is what if I, you know, what if I don't need the, what if I find out afterwards I, don't, I didn't need the money and I didn't, give, I didn't give it back from a safe harbor perspective you know, by this May 14th. And I don't, I don't know the right answer to that, but one of the things I think is interesting, Ryan, is, is that this $2 million threshold will only be reviewed upon the time that a, a forgiveness uh, application is submitted. Right, that's how it reads right now. Right, that's how the rules read. So, you know, if for some reason you get the money in and, and you realize that, you know, hey, this didn't impact me all that much and I, I was able to get through it and, you know, I. I you know, it doesn't. It sounds like from the way the the language is that if only if you apply for forgiveness, so you could pay the loan back, never apply for forgiveness, and probably not be under the scrutiny of the of the uh, Treasury, the SBA, as the rules read. Right. I mean, I think that's a fair statement, Ryan. Yeah, and and I just bold highlighted as the rules currently stand. Right. Right. As as we read the rules today. Um, you know, and as Ryan mentioned, they pushed off the safe harbor date to to May 14th, so. Great. Well, look, we, we recommend just giving, giving this some thought, uh, speaking with your advisors, uh, continuing to monitor the guidance that's, that's issued here. Um, you know, finally, just, just given how much information is still unknown, um, borrowers, lenders, and their advisors should just continue to stay in touch uh, throughout this process. You know, we're, we're hoping we'll get some uh, some real solid guidance uh, soon, but you know, I think we were saying that a week and a half ago. So, yeah, one thing that we haven't necessarily talked about um, here, you know, it, you know, you talked about the best practices. We've talked about this throughout. Is you know, documentation is going to be key, and from the you know from the lender's perspective, you know, what what's a lender? I know we have a lot of them on the line now. You know, from their perspective. Um, you know, what makes sense from a, from a due diligence standpoint, from, from a forgiveness, you know, how much work do, you, do they need to do, you know? Um, what I would say, you know, is reviewing all the support that's, that's filed, you know, making sure that that support is, it looks reasonable, you know, the, the, you know basically the, the guidance says documentation, but let's say that the, the borrower puts on the back of a napkin that they had $50,000 of payroll expense, right? That's documentation, but I don't think that would pass, pass muster. So, um, you know, looking at the 75, 25 limitations when we get more guidance on that, what are the qualified expenses? So I think there's some level of, of due diligence from the lender's perspective that, um, you know, that would need to be done. And, and I'd be remiss if I just didn't mention that, you know, one of the things that Wolf, 
uh, is has a service loan forgiveness service, um, you know, where we can assist with some of this some of this review. Thanks, Dan. Um, you know, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it over to to Mike and Ryan and talk about a little bit of the the tax implications on forgiveness. Thanks, Ryan. It's not often that when a new law comes out, the tax implications take a backseat. Given the powerful nature of this program, I think that is the case here. That said, the tax implications are real and meaningful, and certainly in a time like this, every penny counts. The forgiveness of a loan generates cancellation of debt income that is includable in gross income. However, it is expli explicitly written in the Act that any amount of a covered loan otherwise be includable in gross income of the eligible recipient by reason of forgiveness will be excluded from gross income. In effect, the loan forgiveness on a PPP loan will be treated as tax income. It seems clear what Congress's intent was inclu in including this language in the Act. However, many astute tax professionals were quick to point to a tax provision under Section 265 of the Code that generally prohibits taxpayers from deducting expenses associated with tax-exempt income. This provision is intended to stop taxpayers from deriving a double benefit from tax-exempt income and to maintain neutrality in the tax code. In many ways, permitting a tax-free loan forgiveness without allowing deductions is identical to permitting deductions but treating forgiven loans as taxable income. That is, everything is a push to the taxpayer. Under one alternative, you've got offsetting income expense. Under the other, no income and no expense. Well, on April 30th, the IRS issued Notice 2020-32, which clarified their position and indicated that the provision under Section 265 of the Code would be applicable in this scenario. Accordingly, no deduction is allowed for an otherwise deductible expense if the payment of the expense results in forgiveness of a covered loan. Now, Mike, is this the end of the road with this issue? Thanks, Ryan. I think it's fair to say it's probably not. I mean, since the issuance of Notice 2020-32 last Thursday, congressional leaders from both parties have expressed frustration and concern with the position taken by the IRS. Uh, in fact, in a letter yet sent yesterday to Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, the leadership of the Congressional Tax Committees, Senator Grassley, the Chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, as well as Representative Nail, the Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, urged the IRS to reconsider the position taken in the notice since the disallowance of, the of a deduction for qualifying a cost is inconsistent with the intent of the Paycheck Protection Program. Within the letter to, the Secretary, to Secretary Mnuchin, congressional leadership confirmed that the loan forgiveness provisions of the Paycheck Protection Program were intended to be a tax-free grant to provide funding for payroll and rent during the unprecedented, unprecedented disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The letter also explicitly clarified the statute purposely did not preclude a deduction for qualifying costs, since it would have offset the intended benefit. In effect, congressional leadership acknowledged the argument being made by borrowers that the denial of a deduction is economically equivalent to taxing the forgiveness of, of, of the proceeds. While the letter requested a prompt reconsideration of the IRS position, it's uncertain if or when the IRS will in fact issue further guidance. In absence of any administrative action by the IRS, Representative Neal has suggested additional legislation will be proposed to reinstate the deduction for qualifying costs. Seeing the clock is already running for many borrowers with respect to the eight week covered period, we hopefully will get this clarity soon. In the meantime, stay tuned. We'll certainly be monitoring the situation and updating our COVID-19 Resource Center as additional guidance becomes available. Uh, with the disallowance of the deduction for qualifying expenses, they could be, in the meantime, with the disallowance of the deduction for qualifying expenses, there could be situations in which the benefit provided under the employee retention credit within the CARES Act is greater than the benefit provided under the pay, Paycheck Protection Program. In order to qualify for the employee retention credit, a business must either suspend operations due to a government order related to the COVID-19 pandemic or experience a significant decrease in revenue during 2020. For purposes of these provisions, a significant decrease in revenue 
in order to determine whether or not a, a significant decrease in revenue occurred, a borrower has to compare their revenues in that particular quarter with the revenues in the, in the same quarter during 2019. And if, the de and if revenues decreased by 50% or more, they would be eligible for this credit. However, a business receiving a loan under the Paycheck Protection Program may not claim the, uh, the employee retention credit. And again, the, the, uh, I apologize, I realized I neglected to say what the, uh, what the benefit is uh, under the employee retention credit. It's essentially a refundable payroll cr uh, tax credit of up to $5,000 per employee for wages paid between March 12, 2020 and December 31st, 2020. Accordingly, there have been discussions whether a business that obtained a PPP loan and repays the loan within the safe harbor timeframe that Dan alluded to earlier, uh, which was originally May 7th, but is now May 14th. The discussions have been, could that, could that employer claim the employee retention credit? Unfortunately, it's uncertain under the existing IRS guidance whether a business would be precluded from claiming the credit under those circumstances. Also, another point to take into consideration when doing this analysis is that the credit is generally more favorable for employers with a lower average payroll cost. So oftentimes we find that that may be restrictive uh, for clients and that in fact, the, the, uh, the benefit under the PPP program is still greater. In, direct, in addition to the direct tax implications, being the exclusion of COD income and the disallowance of deductions for qualifying costs, the PPP loan forgiveness also has an indirect impact on a couple of other tax relief provisions included in the CARES Act that we think borrowers should be aware of. In particular, one of the, as borrowers have begun to receive PPP loan proceeds over the past couple of weeks, we have received a number of questions from clients with respect to the deferral of payroll taxes under Section 2302 of the CARES Act. Section 2302 allows all employers, regardless of the number of employees, to defer the deposit and payment of the employer portion of Social Security taxes on wages paid during the period March 27, 2020 through December 31, 2020. 50 percent of the deferred amount must be paid on or before December 31, 2021, with the remaining 50 percent payable on December 31, 2022. However, employers receiving loan proceeds under the PPP program are no longer allowed to defer amounts otherwise due on or after the date on which the employer is notified by the lender that its PPP loan has been forgiven. Accordingly, we've had a number of clients reach out and borrowers reach out to us asking whether or not they still, whether or not they can still defer payroll taxes after they've received the PPP program. Under the, under the guidance issued by the IRS, borrowers are allowed, to defer, are allowed to defer payment of the employer portion of Social Security taxes on wages paid during the eight-week covered period. The guidance issued by the IRS explicitly confirms that amounts deferred through the date on which the notification of forgiveness is received continue to be deferred and will be due on the prescribed, on the prescribed dates. Once again, 50% on or before December 31st, 2021, with the remaining 50% uh, payable on, on or before December 31st, 2022. Reinstatement of the deduction for qualifying costs and exclusion of loan forgiveness amounts from taxable income, it also in light of the economic downturn that people are anticipating during 2020, could contribute to operating losses in 2020. Since the enactment of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act at the end of 2017, businesses have been allowed to use net operating losses to offset taxable income in future years. However, in an effort to allow taxpayer to obtain, taxpayers to obtain more immediate relief, the CARES Act allows taxpayers to carry back net operating losses generated in 2018 through 2020, five years in order to, in, in allowing them to re request refunds of federal income taxes paid in those prior years. The carryback of net operating losses from 2019, 2018 through 2020 is particularly valuable since it allows businesses to offset income subject to tax at higher rates, the higher rates that were in effect before enactment of the Tax Cuts and Job Act. For example, corporations tax rate uh, prior to the, uh, to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was 35 versus the current rate of 25, 21% rather. And for individuals, we're talking a difference of 39.6% versus the current rates of 27% or even 
if a flow through entity qualifies for the qualified small business, uh, qualified business income deduction rather. The, uh, the CARES Act also removed limitations on the deductibility of losses by individuals conducting a business through a sole proprietorship, partnership, or S corporation. The limitation imposed under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act disallowed the deduction for business losses from a sole proprietorship or pass through entity in excess of 518,000 for couples or 259,000 for all other taxpayers during 2020. The CARES Act retroactively eliminated the elimination, thereby, thereby allowing individuals to fully deduct business losses arising in 2018, 2019, and 2020, thereby allowing these individuals to go back and file for re, uh, re, uh, refunds for taxes paid in previous years. While these provisions should allow taxpayers to monetize current and prior period operating losses through refunds of federal income taxes, the extent to which states will conform with these provisions, as well as the federal treatment of PPP loan forgiveness and qualifying expenses is less certain. Ryan, I'll kick it back to you to just go give us a quick overview of that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So while there's still uncertainty at the federal level, there's also uncertainty at the state level. The state tax treatment on the forgiven PPP loans will be dependent on both the state and the type of entity. Some states have a role in conformity to the Internal Revenue Code, meaning when a change is made at the federal level, the state treatment automatically follows suit unless specific legislation is passed accepting the new provision. Some states, such as California, conform to the Internal Revenue Code as of a specific date. Since forgiveness of debt is generally taxable for federal tax purposes, these states may ultimately treat the PPP loan forgiveness as taxable income unless they update their conformity date or take legislative action to follow the federal tax treatment in this specific instance. And in some states, it depends on what type of entity you are. For example, in Massachusetts, corporations adopt the Internal Revenue Code on a rolling basis and require legislation to decouple from new amendments. However, for individuals, Massachusetts adopt the Internal Revenue Code as of 1-1-2005. And so not all new federal provisions receive the same tax treatment at the state level for individuals. Lastly, there is a basis consideration that owners of flow-through entities should be aware of. It's our expectation that any loan forgiveness will result in an increase to tax basis for partners and shareholders in partnerships and S-Corps with the, with the idea that the loan forgiveness is treated as tax-exempt income, which would result in a positive adjustment to basis. So this concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. I'll turn it over to Stephanie now, who will have some closing remarks. Yeah, actually, I'll take some. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions. Looks like we have about five minutes, so. All right, thanks, Dan. Yeah, you know, I'll take, try to answer as many of these questions as we can. Um, first question is, what happens if your business is open, opening next week, but you receive the funds today? Can the funds be used to account for not being open for the past two months? And I think, you know, the answer to that is as the rules are written is, is the funds need to be used for the qualifying expenses from the eight week period uh, starting when you receive the funds from the loan. Uh, we have a question here that says they saw the AICPA is recommending um, aligning the eight week period covered within the beginning of a pay period or begin the covered period when operating restrictions are lifted rather than the date the loan proceeds are received. Um, how do we reconcile that fact of these recommendations and that they seem to conflict with the guidance that uh, Ryan and I had referred to earlier. And you know, this is one of the, this is one of the issues here is, is we only know what the rules state today. We don't know what the rules are gonna state tomorrow. Um, so our, you know, what we said in our presentation today is what we know from the rules and how they're written. And those rules state that your qualified expenses start on the day that the loan is funded. That eight week time period starts then. Um, you know, so we've, we've seen the AICPA's recommendations. Uh, we think they're, they're great recommendations, um, whether or not the Treasury and the SBA take those recommendations and write them into their rules. Uh, is another story. So um, we'll have to wait to see uh, when the when the rules on, around forgiveness come out. Um, another question, if you don't hit 75%, is there guidance on partial loan forgiveness? We touched on that early. It's not a, um, 
you know, sort of a cliff where if you don't hit 75%, you don't get anything. But as I mentioned earlier, there's, there is some question as to how that uh, forgiveness will be calculated when you don't hit 75% on the payroll costs. Another question that uh, I think we hit upon is, is if you accepted, what if you accepted a loan based on an expectation of diminished revenues, but in retrospect, your revenues were not substantially impacted during the eight week period. You know, that goes back to the question 31 and, and I don't have a great answer for that. Ryan, I don't know if you have anything you wanna chime in on here, but I think the, the one thing is, is that as we said, as the rules are written today, um, you know, the review by the treasury is triggered by an application for forgiveness. So, you know, there's always the opportunity to, to send the loan back if you truly didn't need it or didn't use it um, without applying for forgiveness. Um, and again, that's as the rules are written today. The one thing I'd say there is just continue to, uh, to keep your eyes on the FAQs and any additional interim final rules that come out. Um, as they do indicate, they're gonna provide some clarity on, on some of this stuff shortly. You know, next question is, can we use the funds for paying uh, contractors 1099s? Will that be forgiven? I think the answer to that um, is no. Well, that's, that's not a, um, in one of the Q and A's, they just specifically address that because these 1099 contractors can apply on their own. Um, you sort of can't double dip, so they won't, won't allow forgiveness if you're paying them. In an eight week period, how is a $100,000 limit applied? I think um, everything that we're hearing is that if you take the 100,000 and divide it by 52 times the eight weeks, it comes out to, as I mentioned, around $15,384 or $85. I think that's how that limit will be applied. So any, any compensation greater than that uh, during that period for an employee will not be forgiven. Um, question on whether or not the forgiveness is based on the period in which the utilities are used or funded. You know, it's sort of that cash or accrual question and we don't have a great answer now. We're actually looking for some, some guidance from the SBA uh, on that. Another question similar, can we pull forward timing on expenses to fit them into the eight week window? Um, you know, again, we don't have an answer. I think the SBA and their guidance uh, will hopefully address, address this. And I think probably have time for um, you know a couple more questions. You know, do CAM payments paid as part of the monthly rent count for forgiveness, or is it only base rent? Uh, as the rules are written, it just talks about rent. You know, in my own personal opinion, I would think that part of your rental payment is is CAM payments, but um, you know, absent guidance, I think. If you can support that, you may be able to apply for forgiveness for that. And it may, may be what's your lender willing to, uh, to accept. And that AICPA has some good question and answers. And one of the things that they mention is, you know, some qualified expenses where there might be judgment involved. You may want to check with your lender to see what they would, would accept. Ryan, any thoughts on that? And then I think we'll wrap up the questions. No, uh, Dan, I think you've got everything covered here. Yeah, I at that point, I'll turn it back over to Steph. Thanks, Dan, and um, thank you to all the presenters for sharing your perspective on the PPP loan forgiveness. Um, before we end today's webinar, I'd like to ask the audience to participate in a poll. Um, in the coming months, Wolf will be offering a PPP loan forgiveness service, um, in wh which this is going to assist in reviewing the borrower's forgiveness request. So please respond to the poll with the interest in learning more about this service. If you have any outstanding questions, please direct all questions to info at wolfandco.com. Info at wolfandco.com, that's correct. Um, we will monitor the inbox and one of the presenters will respond as soon as possible. As a reminder, a recording of today's webinar and copies of the presentation are available at www.wolfandco.com forward slash webinars forward slash 2020. Immediately following the conclusion of this webinar, you'll have the opportunity to complete a survey. As always, we appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to improve our webinar program. Thanks so much for attending today and we look forward to your participation in future webinars. Have a great afternoon, everyone.